right, anybody glad to be in church today? Come on, can we just give Jesus the best praise? He's worthy of all the praise. Yeah. Hey, you're in the right place at the right time. You're supposed to be here today. I believe that about every single one of you. And like I always do, I want to take a moment and just welcome everybody who's on the other side of the camera with us today. Those of you who are watching long, online, but those of you who are also at our 430 service, we're honored that you uh, would be part of this church with us. And we just say, say thank you for being part of our church family. There's a room full today that just want to say welcome. So come on, seat around campus. Let's give it up for everybody on the other side of the camera. We're glad you're with us today and glad you're part of our church family. We're, we're in part one of a new series today we're calling The Beautiful Attitudes. And it's actually based off of what is the most popular sermon that Jesus ever preached, that we know of, that's written in the Word. It's the Beatitudes is what it's known of in the Scripture. But we're going to call them the, the Beautiful Attitudes because these, these Beatitudes are really principles. They're... they're um, their values, their kingdom principles or kingdom values that you could live by. And, and Jesus gives us these beautiful attitudes that we ought to incorporate in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I just think if it's in the Word, if it's in the Bible, then it's probably worth applying to my life, right? It's probably worth uh, looking into what does Jesus have to say. And so these nine beautiful attitudes, what we're going to do is we're going to take nine weeks over the, over the course of the entire summer, all of June and all of July, and we're going to take one beautiful attitude every single week, and we're going to discover this kind of attitude that Jesus wants us to have. Now, I've got to warn you, though. I've got to warn you that um, this is going to be a difficult series because the beautiful attitudes are countercultural. They're, they're opposite of what the world does. They're opposite of what maybe happens outside of the church and so Jesus is calling us to have beautiful attitudes and and here's what we need to know in case you don't know this is that in the world and out, outside of the walls of the church the, the world is forcing you to choose a side forcing you to, to pick a side us versus them and and we see a lot of polarization that's taking place in our culture today don't we Oh, come on. I, I, maybe I'm the only one who notices the polarization. <laughs> There's a lot of polarization, a lot of us versus them, a lot of our way versus their way. There's a lot of that that's taking place, and I'm not trying to be negative or, or, be, or, or be a naysayer, but I think that it's going to get more intense as, as the political season he, heats up, okay? Can we just be honest about it? And so because of that, I feel like it's part of my role to teach and train you as the church on how to incorporate these nine beautiful attitudes in our lives if we're going to be Christ followers. If we're going to represent Jesus to a lost, dying, and broken world, we ought to figure out the attitudes he wants us to have. Amen? All right. So that's what we're going to do today, and we're kicking off with, um, I'll take a little bit of time this morning to kind of share with you the, the idea behind these beautiful attitudes, and I'm going to give you the first beautiful attitude as well. But if you've got your notes, I want you to take those out. Uh, today's notes looks more like a booklet, all right? It's a lot of, a lot of notes in there today, um, it, it, and, and I would love for you to follow along uh, either on the screen or in your notes. There's some fill-in-the-blanks that I would love for you to, to keep those, fill those out, keep those in a place where you can refer back to them. But let's look at this idea of the beautiful attitudes. It comes from the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. It says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and he sat down. Now, I went to this mountainside where they believe Jesus taught these principles last year. I got to, I got to see it with my own eyes. It's just beautiful, right along the Sea of Galilee. And when he got there, he sat down, and the, the disciples came to him, and they began to teach him, or he began to teach them, and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, so as we go through these nine be beatitudes, the beautiful attitudes, we're going to take them in order that Jesus gave them. So today, we're going to talk about blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to notice, every one of them begins with the same word, blessed is the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, that's next week, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, we're going to talk about that on Father's Day weekend, for they will inherit the kingdom, or the earth, they'll inherit the earth. Blessed 
are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They want to do what's right. They want to live the kind of life that God's called them to because he'll give them the power to do it. They'll be filled with that ability. Blessed are the merciful. Come on, don't we need some mercy in our culture today? And, and how many of you would like to receive some mercy? So the truth is, if you want to receive mercy, then you've got to give the mercy because we reap what we sow. That's the principle all the way from the beginning of time. And if we show mercy, we'll be shown mercy, he says. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. We need some peacemakers to rise up in America again. We need some peacemakers in our city, peacemakers in our school, because they'll be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Now, some theologians say that there's eight beatitudes or beautiful attitudes. We're going to teach you nine. We're going to take the last two, and, and, and we're going to teach two weeks, because the last two are both about persecution. And, and so we're going we're gonna to say that there's nine of these beautiful attitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted because they take a stand for Jesus, because of righteousness, because theirs is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those people. Blessed are you when people write negative stuff about you on social media. And they persecute you and they insult you and they falsely say all kinds of evil things about you because you're a Christian. Because you're a believer. You're blessed because of that. And he says, don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. Don't complain about it. In fact, be glad. Does <laughs> anybody want to just be like Jesus? Be glad? What? <laughs> be glad? Because great is your reward. Your reward isn't on earth. Your reward is in heaven. Amen. Great is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets. Okay, they, they talked bad about the prophets. They talked bad about... All, the people of the Old Testament, they talk bad about Jesus. So get ready. As a Christ follower, it's going to happen to you too, all right? Now, you've got to say, well, uh, man, Pastor Ben, where's the good news? <laughs> you're, supposed to give, you're supposed to give us some good news today, and I'm going to give you some good news. The good news is we can have these kind of attitudes. We can live these kind of attitudes. And so over the next nine weeks, my prayer is that God would soften your heart. God would work, that you would open up your hearts to what, what does God want to do in me? How, how can I have these kind of attitudes? How can I take on this kind of attitude? So I want to show you today, I want to start by kind of setting up these beautiful attitudes, all right? And there's a couple things that we see with these beautiful attitudes. The first thing is that Jesus teaches us, he shows us in your notes, he shows us or reveals to us where true joy comes from. Everybody say joy. 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 He, he tells us where true joy comes from. So every one of these beatitudes, these attitudes start with the word blessed. And the word blessed, it, it doesn't mean to be happy. It doesn't mean to accumulate wealth. It doesn't mean to have all of this stuff. No, the word blessed is actually referencing an internal joy that the world can't take away from you. It's an internal joy that that can't be taken away by the things of life, by the things that you go through, and that is very different from happiness. You see, happiness is derived from happenings. They have the same root word. So happiness is based off of what happens to you. Happiness is happenstance. Well, well, um, if it rains, I'm not happy. If it's sunny, I'm happy. Oh, if you, if you don't get the promotion, you're not happy. But if you do get the promotion, I'm happy. If your team wins, you're happy. Man, I'm happy that Tennessee won. They beat Clemson yesterday in baseball. I'm happy about that. It's awesome. But if they lost, it'd be a bad day. I'm thankful that we don't live our lives based on what, whether our team wins or loses. Come on. So we, that's, that's happiness, though. If we're basing our response our happiness on things that that's not joy that's happiness and so i think what god wants for us as christians the word christian means to be like christ to be a christ follower so i believe that god would want us as christians to be the kind of people whose joy is not dependent on what happens to them i'm going to say that again god wants us to be the kind of people whose joy is not based on what happens to them in this life, but they have an internal joy that the world can't take away. 
Let me say it this way. No happening can take your joy away. That's, that's the kind of blessed, blessed. He wants to give us real joy, all right? Now, there's, a couple, there's one other thing that I notice about this, these scriptures, these attitudes, and that is every one of them also say something like, for theirs or they are. And what that reveals to us, what Jesus is showing us, is that there's a potential of what can be ours. Y'all following me? So he shows us where real joy comes from. If you will live like this, if you'll take on these kind of attitudes, if you'll take on this kind of, this kind of kingdom value and principle, you'll, you'll have a, a life that's blessed. You'll, you'll, you'll be fulfilled. But also, I want to show you that there's more that can be yours. You can inherit the kingdom of God. You can, have, you can have peace in your life. You can have joy in your life. So when we named this church City Hope, we hadn't even moved here yet. We were living in Alabama. We were still kind of praying about whether we're going to start this church or not. But we knew the name would be City Hope. And the reason we named it City Hope is because we believe that hope is the one word that everybody on earth can identify with. It's the one word that everybody knows what it means because everybody is hoping for something, right? I mean, you're hoping for the promotion. You're hoping for the raise. You're hoping the marriage can be reconciled. You're hoping that your children maybe come off of the streets and come off of the addiction. You're hoping that things work out wherever it might. You're, you're hoping that you make the team. There's a lot of hope in life. And what we believed was from the very beginning that City Hope would be the kind of church where, where people would have hope. But that hope is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's not fulfilled in things of the earth. It can only be found in Jesus. In fact, our mission statement is three, three things. Here's what we do. We love God, we love people, and we give hope. It's on the back of t-shirts that... That we, that we do, it's everywhere. It's in the growth track room. We love God. We love people. We give people hope. That is what we've been called to do. But see, a lot of Christians settle for salvation. I'm just trying to build a case here today. And you go, well, what do you mean settle for salvation? Salvation is the best thing that's ever happened to us. Yes. Thank God for salvation. But too many Christians stop there. Yeah, I confessed my sins. Yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. Yeah, I got right with God. But they, they, don't re, they don't realize that there's more that God has for them. There's more to the life. Salvation's not the finish line, everybody. It's the starting line that God has more for you. That God wants to do more in your life. That God wants to heal you. God wants to stir up gifts and passions and talents inside of you. That God has a dream and a destiny for your life. That God has a healing for your marriage. That God wants to do something great. Amen. I thought I was at City Hope today, but this sounds like the first church of the frozen chosen. Come on, somebody. I guess it's just quiet because I'm preaching good. I don't, I don't know what it is. You, so, so a lot of Christians, are, they just stop at salvation. That's great, but listen to me. There's more for your life. There's more for what God has for you. See, a lot of you are going to heaven, and thank God for that, but you're living in a hell on earth. Because you haven't discovered what God has for you. You haven't discovered the more that can be yours. You haven't discovered the potential of your life. And I call it hell on earth because anything other than what God's called me to do would be miserable to me. It was just, just going through the motion. I was just going through life. That would be miserable. But I know what I'm called to do. I know the purpose that God has for my life. I'm just trying to help you see God has more for you. And we're going to learn that through these nine beautiful attitudes that Jesus teaches us. So let's jump in to, to week one, and that is, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says in verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus uses the most extreme term for poor that could be used here. He's not just saying, oh, that poor pitiful man. Oh, he's not saying, bless their heart. Y'all know in the South, that means, what an idiot. Oh, my God. Y'all know that. He's not saying, I oh, bless her. The word poor here is, it literally means a beggar. 
someone who cannot provide for themselves. They literally need benevolence in order to survive. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, now there's a difference. How many of you know there's a difference between poor and po? <laughs> Was there, anybody grew up po? Anybody grew up po in the house? I, I grew up, we were po. And there's a difference. Poor. Oh, he's so poor. No, no. This is po. It's, it's beggar. Here's what Jesus is really trying to say. He, he's saying, blessed is the person who realizes they're completely destitute without God. That they are utterly helpless. Blessed is the one who realizes they have an absolute need for God. If God doesn't come through for me, I'm done. If God doesn't come through, I'm through. That's what, that's what he's saying here. Is it's complete, complete destitution. Let me show it to you in three other translations. All right? He says... God blesses, this is the NLT, the New Living Translation, my favorite version to read. If you're looking for easy to read, it just, that's, that's uh, a great version, this is it, New Living Translation. God blesses those who are poor and they realize they need him. I need you, Jesus. God, in the, in the God's Word Translation, Jesus says, blessed are those who recognize they're spiritually helpless. They're they, they can't provide for themselves. They can't save themselves. They can't get to heaven on their own. And in the New Century Version, it says, those people who know they have great spiritual needs, they're the ones that are happiest. They're the ones that are blessed. And so the problem, the problem most of us face today is that most of us don't realize how spiritually impoverished we are. Most of us don't realize how spiritually bankrupt we are. That without God, we're nothing. See, we, we believe in our culture and in our society, we're very affluent. And so we believe that we're more capable than we are. We believe we're more capable, that we can do more, that I can work my way into heaven. That I, I mean, it's just, I can, I can be 51% better than I am bad. I can, I can do that. And see... The truth is, every person in this room today is richer than 99% of the rest of the world. Amen. You have more. And your problems are problems the rest of the world would love to have. They, 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 would, they would be happy to have your kind of problems. But in our culture today, we're self-sufficient. And because we're self-sufficient we become self-righteous and we don't see our need for a savior. We can't see our, our, that we're destitute. We can't see that we need Jesus. And so my goal today is to help us see that. See, here, here's the thing. Here, the reason why I believe we see miracles happening in other nations, the reason why in China, for example, millions of people are coming to know Jesus there, even in the midst of persecution, in the Middle East where they can lose their life and, and, and be killed because they convert to Christianity, and we're seeing hundreds upon, uh, uh, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people converting is because they have nothing to lose. They're completely destitute. They have nothing else left. But here in America... What do I need to be saved from? Like for many of you, you've got a great marriage, you've got a great home, your life is good, your kids are well behaved, you're not addicted to anything. What do I need to be saved from? And here's the truth. In your notes, write this down, that we will never depend on something we don't think we need. Well, why? I mean, why do I need to be a Christian? My life's good. Why do I need to go to church? I don't have any problems. Why do I need Jesus? I mean, my, my life is, pr is pretty okay. Like, I'm not struggling with anything. Why do I need to change anything? Why, why, what do I need to be saved from? And could I ask you today, when's the last time you depended on God? When's the last time you were utterly, completely dependent on Him? And if He didn't come through, it was over. When's, when's the last time? So, to be, to be poor in spirit means... 
I can't do this on my own, Jesus. It's not all about your finances. It's not all about that. It's about coming to Jesus and saying, I can't do this without you. I am utterly, completely dependent on you for everything in my life, Jesus. That's, that's what I want to help you see today. And so one of the most challenging things for me today is to, to help you learn how to be poor in spirit. All right? My pastor in Alabama, he used to tell us, our, our church where, where we were on staff at was in a community that had like 300 churches in the county. Churches everywhere. Here in Wichita Falls, church to community, churches everywhere. So many people have heard about Jesus. They know about Jesus. And so he would often say, hey, we have to get people lost before we can get them saved. We have to help them see their need for God before we, before we can tell them about God. We have to help them get lost before we can get them saved. And I guess that's my role today is I'm just trying to help you see that you're lost without God. That you're lost without Him. And my goal is to help you see that you need a Savior. So we're going to do that today. I just want to help us see that we're, that we're broken, we're, we're needy, we're lost without Jesus. And if you, if you can get that, you'll be blessed. Amen. You'll be blessed, all right? So we just finished up a series on the second coming. And I'm actually kind of excited because I can, I can preach to you now. It's like, I, I, I enjoyed that series, six weeks of the end times, boy. But now I'm ready to preach on something else. Come on, somebody. We're going ready to preach on something else. I'm going I'm to teach you how to get to heaven, all right? Teach you how to get there by having these nine attitudes. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to start with this passage of Scripture from Revelation. We just finished the series on the end times, and we studied a lot about Revelation. We're going back there again today. Because John is the author of Revelation. He was one of Jesus' disciples, apostles, close friend. And he wrote the book of Revelation when he was in uh, prison. He was exiled to an island called Patmos. He was on the chain gang. And while he's there on that island, he has a vision from Jesus. Jesus comes down, speaks to him about seven churches, and he writes out the words of Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to one of the churches. He said, I know your deeds. I know that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. I wish you would be one or the other. He says, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. But you say, well, God, I'm rich. Like, why do I need you? I've, I've got everything I need. I've acquired wealth. I have all of this stuff. My life is good. We're not, we're not dealing with anything. We're, like, we're, we're good to go. I don't need a thing. And Jesus says, that's kind of your problem. Because you don't realize that without me, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. And that's what I want to help us see today, is that without Jesus, this is us. Without Jesus, this is who we are. We're broken. We're blind. And so, if you're taking notes, we're going we're gonna to study four things that we are without Jesus, and then four things we are with Jesus. So... Let's go. Let's do this, all right? Number one, without Jesus, I have to pay for my own sins. Without Jesus, I'm responsible. See, salvation is not about just being good enough. Salvation is not about doing all the right spiritual things. It's not about how you pray or how you read your Bible and how you do all of those things. Salvation is even, it's not even about saying you're sorry. And for, for a lot of people, they don't, they don't understand salvation they don't realize that that we have all sinned like every one of us have sinned even if your life is good and you think i don't need to be saved from anything i'm, I'm good pastor ben all of us have sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god and our sin demands a payment and that payment is death the the wages what i earned what my sin what my life before christ earned me was death but the good news is, God has a gift for me. And that gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord. See, see what our sins earned us was eternal damnation. Like, it earned us hell. 
And some people, they want to know. They, they don't understand. They're confused. They go, well, why would a loving God send people to hell? But he doesn't. God actually doesn't send anyone to hell. People go to hell to pay for their own sins. They, they choose to go there to pay for their own way. They said, I don't, I don't, I don't need this. I don't need God. I'm, my life's good. I'm fine. I, I don't need church. I don't need Christianity. I don't need Jesus. I'll, I'll just pay for it my own way. But here's what he did because of Jesus. Because Jesus came to the earth. Now I have, I have the free gift of salvation and eternal life because of what Jesus did for me. Come on, somebody. That's the best news of the day. We can know God. We can have relationship with God. We can have purpose in God. So, so what's salvation all about? How, like, what's the big deal about it? So we all have to realize that we're sinners. Yes, but we also have to realize that there is nothing I can do to earn my salvation. I can't buy my way there. I can't be good enough. Well, how am I saved, Pastor Ben? Paul says in Ephesians, it's by grace that you've been saved. It was because God was good to us, because God is loving and he's kind and he's gentle. That's how we got saved. It was through faith in him, and it wasn't from ourselves. It wasn't because I had it all and I could be good enough. It wasn't the 51% better that, that I got there. No, it was by grace. It's not myself. It's a gift of God. It's not because I worked for it. It's not because I deserved it. It's not because I was Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live. Y'all remember him? Any, anybody remember? Because I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. It wasn't, it wasn't because of that. I didn't get to heaven because people liked me. No, I got there because of grace. Because of the faith in Jesus Christ. And so some of you, you've made a decision to follow Jesus. You've made a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Nearly 400 people so far this year, documented salvations here at church, have said yes to Jesus. That's incredible. And your next step is water baptism. Your next step is to, today, walk out in that lobby and say, I'm ready to go all in. I'm ready to take my next step and to be water baptized. You go out to that table in the lobby, check in. They'll give you a change of clothes, a shirt, towel, all the stuff that you'll need. Underwear, even. Clean, brand new underwear out of the box. Never been worn. All right? For you. Because we're just trying to make it easy. We're trying to take away the excuse. We're just trying to help you see how... The, the next steps that God has for you today, don't, don't leave here without taking that next step. Take, we've all incurred a debt. Every one of us have a debt to pay, and we, can't, we cannot pay it on our own. But because of Jesus, by grace, through faith, we can be saved. Amen? Amen. Or we can know God. Here's the second one. Without Jesus, I can only cope through my pain. Without Jesus, I can... Without Jesus, all I can do is medicate the pain that I'm experiencing. And here's the thing. What happens when that medication wears off? What are you left with? The pain. Pain. And there's, there are some good coping mechanisms in this world. There's some good things that you could do, but for some reason, a lot of people turn to unhealthy coping habits. It starts out as one pill to numb the pain, and then it turns into pill after pill after pill. It starts out as one drink to just knock off the edge, and it turns into drink after drink after drink after drink. It starts out as just one relationship to kind of help me think about something else, and then it turns into Relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship. It starts off as, I mean, nobody knows what I'm doing. It's all secret, and I, I'll just, I, I won't do this for long. I'm just going to scroll a little bit, but then it turns into website after website after website after website, after search after search. It starts off as just one late night snack. I'm just, I just need a little comfort food, but then it turns into bite after bite after bite after bite. And I'm not saying any of this to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to help you see that in, in some way, we're all dealing with it. 
In some way, we're all affected by, by the hurts and the pains. But I want you to know today, I need you to understand, I need you to get it deep inside of you that God's plan was never for you to just cope with the pain. God's plan for you was never to just get by and to just cope with all of the stuff that you're going through in life. God's plan for you was never to just, just work, I'm, I'm just going to deal with it, I'm just going to do I'm just going to go through it. No, no, no. God's plan was never for you to just cope with it. And I don't know if you know who you were before Christ, but I know who I was before Christ. I know that I was a 13-year-old abused little boy who just felt unloved and unworthy and no self-worth, no self-esteem. I was the class clown, insecure, feeling like I'd just do anything to make somebody laugh. I felt like I could never be good enough. I could never measure up. God would never be happy with me until I realized that because of Jesus, I can be healed and transformed. I don't have to cope with the pain anymore. I don't have to deal. I can be healed from that. I can overcome this kind of stuff. I can overcome the things that I've dealt with. Well, how, Pastor Ben? Peter says, because Jesus bore our sins. And what did he do? By his wounds, we have been healed. I can't heal myself. I've got to come to Jesus. Because of Jesus, I can be healed. Because of Jesus, I can be free. See, you were like sheep going astray. You didn't have a shepherd. You had wandered away. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. I need you to understand. I need you to get today that there is a shepherd and there is an overseer for your soul. He loves you. He's called, called you out. He has a purpose for you your life. He wants to do great things in you. He wants to heal you and transform you. And I'm, I'm telling you, God's here today to heal you. I, as, I, as I prepared this message, every, ta- every, every time I got to this one place, I just felt an anointing for you to know today, every person in this room today, for you to know. There's some people here. I don't know who you are, but you're struggling in your mind. Anxiety, panic attacks, Depression, fear, worry, sleepless nights. You, f- you feel hopeless. You feel, you feel alone. And I just want you to know today that God is here to heal you. Amen. God is here to break those chains off of your life. And he may do it miraculously, but oftentimes he does it relationally. God can heal you miraculously, but oftentimes he heals you relationally. See, here's the thing. Most of our wounds in life come through relationships, people. But did you know that the primary way that God heals you? Through people. And some of you have built such walls up that you're keeping everybody out. And God's saying, I can't heal you until you let some people in. And that's why today I want to encourage you to get in a small group. Today, we're launching over 60 groups for the summer today. And you're going to see people wearing these small group shirts all across the, the campus today. If you don't know which group to get part of, ask them. Go, go to our online directory. Search the groups. Find the one that's right for you. And, and maybe not the first day, but really quick, I need you to identify somebody in that room that you can become a friend with. Somebody that you can take the mask off with and say, hey, this is what I'm coping with. This is what I'm dealing with. This is the hurt and the pain that's in my life. And when you do that, you're not going to be met with, good God Almighty, I can't believe you do stuff like that. (laughs) That's not what you're going to hear. What you're going to hear is, I I know exactly where you've been. Me too. I've struggled with the same stuff. I, I know where you're at. See, here's the thing. You'll always be as sick as your secrets. So you have to get it out. That's where real healing and life change begins. All right, I got to move on. I got to hurry. I could preach this. Man, I just, I, I'm, I'm feeling it today. Num- number three, without Jesus, I'm just searching. I'm, I'm just searching for meaning. I don't have purpose in my life without Jesus. I mean, without Jesus, I'm just trying to, I, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know what God wants for my life. But the Bible says that every one of you, every person on earth was born on purpose for a purpose. Amen. He has something that he wants for your life. He has something that he has planned for your life. And here's the thing. You will never understand God's purpose for your life apart from a relationship with him. But, like you, you will never understand what God's called you to do without a relationship with Jesus. You can't have purpose without Jesus. 
Now, you can have something, a facade. You can have a, a counterfeit, but you can't have the very thing that God has created you to do without relationship with Jesus. That's why every month we do the growth track. Today, step one of the growth track. So many of you ask us, how do you get involved? How do, you, how do you get on the dream team? How do you serve? How do you, how do you be a, become a part of what you're doing? How do you join the church growth track? Today's step one, mission, vision, values, who we are. Next week, step two, it's about the journey that God has for you, the spiritual gifts that God has for you. We're a church that believes that the spiritual gifts did not cease, that they are still alive and well, and God has a gift for you today. He has a purpose for your life today. And, and so go through the growth track. Discover what God has called you to do. See, here, here's the thing. The Bible says, Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, This was our theme verse for our church when we started the church. God says, I know the plans I have for you. Who knows the plans? God. Okay, so then you're not going to find them in the world. Who knows the plans? God does. God knows the plans that he has for you. And the plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. They're plans to give you a hope and a future. God has something great for your life, and you can't find it anywhere else. And so without Jesus, I'm just searching. But because of Jesus, I can know who I am. And I can know what my life is all about. I know what God's called me to do. I know the life that he wants me to live. And that's what I want for you. I want every one of you to know why God created you. And, and here's the thing. Because of Jesus, I can realize that I am spiritually and utterly broken. I have nothing without Jesus. He's my everything. Without Jesus, I can't, I can't do anything. See, I'm, I'm trying to convince you. Don't, don't just settle for salvation. Don't just settle for going to heaven. That's great. But discover your purpose. See, God had something for you before you were ever born. But while you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, he had something for you. He had a plan for your life. The Bible says when you were being knit together in your mother's womb, he knew you. Psalm 139 talks about that everything that you would ever do was written in the book before you ever came to be. It's, it's there. He has a purpose for your life. Paul says it this way, that you are God's handiwork. Another translation says masterpiece. Brush stroke by brush stroke. God is working excellence into your life. He has a purpose for your life. And you were created not to just go to heaven, but to do some good works. You were created to make a difference. You were created to live a life. Not, not your, your works don't get you to heaven. But you were saved for the good works, and, the, and, and these good works were prepared in advance for you. Amen. While you were still in your mother's womb, he had a plan. For, before there was a you, there was something for you to do. There was something that God had for you. I love what Acts says, that from one man he made all the nations, and they should, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history. In other words, God knew that on June 4th, at this service today, you would be here. And he had a plan that you would be here in this room. He marked out the appointed times in history, the boundaries of their lands. But why? Why did he care so much about me, Pastor Ben? Because his plan was always that you would return to him, that you would seek him, that you would reach out to him, that you would come to this point in your life where you say, I'm nothing without Jesus. And that you would find him though he's not far away and you would find him because for in him we live and move and have our being. I need you, Jesus. That's why he did it. He came to the earth so that you would turn to him. And, and you'll, you can search the world over. I searched the world over and thought I found true love. You met another and you were gone. You could search the world over. You could try everything else, but you're not going to find your purpose and plan apart from Jesus. Come on, somebody. It's all in him. Let me give you four. Number four, without Jesus, you're just living for joys that fade. It's all counterfeit. It all, it's not going to fulfill you. It's not going to last. It's a joy that fades. And, and this is what psychologists call anhedonia. Anhedonia is the feeling of 
no pleasure. You can't feel pleasure. It's, it's, you're feeling less. You don't, you don't enjoy things. What you used to enjoy, you don't enjoy. The things that used to bring you happiness don't bring you happiness anymore. It's, it's the absence. It's the inability to feel pleasure. What you used to enjoy doesn't work anymore. And Peter says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why are, we, why are we praising God when we are chasing joys that fade away? No, no. We're praising God because, because we have great mercy. We're praising God that in His great mercy, He's given us, I don't have to chase things that are meaningless. I, I don't have to live for joys that fade away. Because of His mercy, I have a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not a hope that might be or could be or, or, maybe, or maybe be. No, it's a living hope. And through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, I have an inheritance. It's a living hope for an inheritance that can never perish. It can never fade away. It can never spoil. It can never be taken away. What's the inheritance, Pastor Ben? The inheritance is the joy of making a difference in someone else's life. That's, that's the inheritance. That's, that's what it's about. The inheritance is when you go to bed at night knowing that I am living my life for something better than me, something greater than me. It's not just about me. It's not just about what I want. It's not just about my feelings and my fulfillment. It's that I'm making a difference in the lives of other people. This is what you did yesterday at First Saturday Serve. Dozens of people out yesterday making a difference, mowing people's yards. Yesterday, over 600 people were fed because people were making a difference. Because pe people said, you know what, there's more to this life than just what I want to do. There's more to this life than just me doing whatever feels good for me. That's why we do First Saturday service, to make a difference. You're not mowing a yard to just mow somebody's yard. You're mowing a yard to give them Jesus. You give them Jesus. It's not just social justice. It's spiritual justice. And the happiest people I know are the ones who they've discovered that they're bankrupt without Jesus. The happiest people I know are the ones who go, I am nothing. I can't do anything. I can't be anyone. I have nothing. I am nothing. Without Jesus, I'm utterly, completely destitute. The happiest people I know are the ones who are completely dependent on God. And, and they live their lives to make a difference. They live their lives for purpose. So here's, here's the last one. Because of Jesus, I can have the joy of making a difference. So I'm not just living for a joy that fades away. But because of Jesus, I have the joy of making a difference, not for my glory, not for my name, not for what I want. I have the joy of making a difference for eternity. For the glory of God, that his name would be famous, that his name would be recognized, that his name would be known. And this is exactly what Jesus said in John 15. He said that this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. You could say that you make a difference, that you use your gifts, that you discover why you were created. What did God want for you? It's, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And as you bear the fruit, you show the rest of the world that you're His disciples, that you have this beautiful attitude that becomes attractive to people. And they go, I don't know what it is about this person, but I really like being around them. They're not rude. They're not hateful. They're not angry. They just... They're just so pleasant. People were attracted to Jesus, you know. Sinners were attracted to Jesus. They loved being around Him. And that's why we love being around Him, because we're all sinners. We're all jacked up. And Jesus says, I've told you this, that my joy may be in you. I've, I've told you about this fruit I want you to bear. Because it's going to bring joy to your life if you do it. And this joy will make you complete. Your joy will be made complete in you today. So if, if there was, if there's one just small phrase that I could use to kind of wrap this day up, what, what does it mean to be poor in the spirit? It, it would be 
it would be this. Jesus, I need you. I'm nothing without you. I can't do anything without you. I'm broken without you. I'm hurting without you. I need you. Would you bow your heads with me today? Close your eyes and let me lead us in a prayer. Father, I thank you that you're in this room today to help us see our inability to save ourselves, our inability to do anything on our own, that, that we would come to this place in life that may be very difficult for some of us, but this place in life where we realize we're nothing, we have nothing, we can be nothing, we, we possess nothing, There's, we have no ability to do anything for our lives, for our eternity, for our purpose apart from you. We are completely broken, hurting, needy without you. So God, I pray that you'd reveal that to each one of us. That we would lean on you more than ever before. That we would become poor in spirit. Because we will inherit the kingdom of God. Lord, let that be our prayer today. With your head still bowed, your eyes closed. Some of you, you're poor in spirit today. And you didn't realize it until just now. You, you didn't realize how far from God you really are. You didn't realize how broken, how needy, how, how spiritually impoverished, spiritually bankrupt that you are. You're far from God. And today you feel the weight of your sin. You feel the weight of guilt and shame and condemnation and brokenness. You feel the weight of hurt and pain, all the decisions of your past, all, all of your life just kind of stacking up on you today. You feel it. But can I, can I tell you today that God is here to heal you. God is here to transform you. God is here to give you a new starting line. Salvation can be yours today, but that's just the starting line. And if you're here today and you realize how far you are from God and you're ready to acknowledge Him as your Savior, your Lord, I want to give you that opportunity. I want to give you the opportunity to, to surrender, to put your hope in Him, not hope in yourself, not hope in anything else, but hope in Jesus, to surrender your life, complete control to Him. And if that's you, you're ready to do that. You're ready to completely surrender your life to Him. On the count of three, I want you to boldly and courageously lift your hand and, and just keep it up, and I want to lead you in a prayer, all right? Ready? One, two, three. Come on, if that's you, lift up your hand. I see you. I see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Anybody else would say that's me, Ben? Thirteen. Who else would say 14, 15, 16, 17, 18? Anyone else? That's me. I'm going all in. 19. I'm so proud of every hand that's up, every person who's saying yes today. Come on, this is the best day of your life. This is the start of a new day, new beginning, fresh start, your best day, your best decision. All right? With ha hands down, let's all say this prayer together today. We commit ourselves to God all together. Say, Jesus. I love you, and I need you. I realize how broken and how needy I am. I can't do this without you. My life is nothing without you. So I surrender. I'm asking you to be my Lord, my Savior, my best friend. Will you forgive me? Cleanse me. Give me new life. And from this day forward, I will live for you the best that I know how. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God the best praise we can today, church. Come on, let's thank God today. Amen.